Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast series. My name is Scott Miller and I have privileged to have been serving as your host from the very beginning episode. We're now into the third year of Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast, now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast dedicated to topics all around how we define leadership, recognizing that all of us have a different point of view on what leadership means. Some of us are leaders in our own startups, as entrepreneurs, as solopreneurs. Some of us are leaders of teams at the executive level or even the front line level. Some of us are leaders of just ourselves or perhaps in our roles as parents and spouses and family members. And this podcast has been transformative for me. To have sat in this chair for, gosh, nearly 200 interviews has been transformative for me which is why the company endorsed and HarperCollins leadership has allowed me now to write a book about the Franklin Covey podcast series called Master Mentors, on sale now on Amazon, published by HarperCollins leadership. The tagline is 30 transformative insights from our greatest minds. So from the first 75 or so interviews, I curated 30 guests who I thought had a particularly transformative insight. And I wrote a short, breezy chapter about each guest, one insight per chapter. And I'd love it if you picked up a copy. My sense is, is that HarperCollins will include uh, volumes two, three, four, and 10 for the coming hundreds of episodes that we have, including, perhaps if she agrees today, our guest, Esther Wojcicki, who is known as the godmother of Silicon Valley, professor, parent, friend, and really coach around how to raise successful people. The topic and title of her current book, Esther, welcome to On Leadership. I'm honored and excited to be here. Thank you so much for including me. Esther, we are honored to have you here. Now, the fact of the matter is, you were supposed to be on our podcast several weeks ago, but I called and canceled because I had not yet finished the book. And as you know from our previous conversation, I'm a parent with my wife, Stephanie, to three boys, all who which have my personality to my wife's outrage and horror. And those three boys are healthy and thriving in spite of my best interests or my best efforts otherwise. Our boys are six, nine, and 11, and school is out. It's in the middle of summer, so I'm hoping to take some great nuggets away from you today. Esther, before we get into the topic of your most current book, um, How to Raise Successful People, would you talk a bit about your journey? Because how you were raised by your parents through your grandparents' journey is quite instructive to how you now have parented your three very successful daughters. Will you take plenty of time and kind of recreate your childhood and the connection it has to how you've parented, and in many cases become a parenting expert? Well, first I was born in New York City. My parents were Russian immigrants. My father was from the Ukraine and my mother was from Siberia. And I was the first one born here in the United States. Uh, Neither one of them had a college education. Actually, my father dropped out in eighth grade. My mother was dropped out, I think, in 11th grade. And it wasn't, they didn't drop out because of lack of interest. They dropped out because they didn't have enough money. So my family was, they were Orthodox Jews. And in the Orthodox Jewish family, um, the man, the boy, is considered superior to the girl. And the main reason is because in the religion, the men are the only ones that can say prayers for the dead. And so everybody wants to have a boy because they want somebody to say a prayer for them when they die. So apparent to me, actually, only because I was told that when my brother was born, my father basically said in so many words, I think my brother must have been three days old or four days old, something like that, and which he said to me, you know, um, I just want to tell you that your brother is going to be the most important person in the family now, and that's because he's a boy. And, you know, I just didn't even know what to think. First of all, I was just a little girl, and I already was seemed to be the pride and joy of everybody, and all of a sudden I was displaced. So I didn't really take it seriously. I didn't really know too much about what was going to happen. But, you know, as time went on, I learned that that was what was you know, the boys were more important. Um, all the financial resources went to saving money so he could go to college. Um, I was not allowed or not supposed to go to college at all um, because I was just supposed to get married when I was 18 and, you know, be a homemaker. So that was a bit of a, you know, it was a difficult situation. I think the other thing that happened in my childhood 
that really had a huge impact on me was uh, happened when I was 10 years old. Um, I had another brother and he was about 18 months old when he was playing in the kitchen on the floor with a bottle and it turned out it was a bottle of aspirin and at that time it was bare aspirin and they didn't have those child protective caps that they do now. So he opened it up and then he ate it, um, like almost all of it. And you know, you wonder, God, why would a kid eat aspirin? It tastes so awful, but he did. And my mother, she didn't really know what to do. As I mentioned, she was an immigrant and also she came from this family where the like men are so most important. So she called the doctor and the doctor told her, uh, he wasn't listening, it must be clear. He's like, oh, just put him to bed and see how he is in a couple of hours. It was probably just a canned answer that he just gave to all these parents because people were just probably calling him all the time. That's the only thing I can think of. Anyway, she being unsure of herself and unwilling to take a risk and unwilling to question and unwilling to say, hey, by the way, is that really a good idea? She followed the doctor's orders. And so if you just think about what happens to somebody that ingests a poison, and waits a few hours, well, of course, you know, they get really sick. And that's what happened. He got really sick. And, um, and then uh, he unfortunately, um, after his stomach was pumped in one of the hospitals, we went to some other hospitals and unfortunately um, he died. And uh, so this had a huge impact on me. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, I was only 10 years old. But what it said to me as a child, in my childhood life thinking, it said, you know, if no matter what the title is of somebody, no matter who they are, if what they say doesn't sound like it makes sense, you should question it. You should try to find out that answer, that information for yourself. And so that's what I ended up doing, you know, without knowing that was the impetus for me behaving that way, I ended up being a, a voracious reader of nonfiction nonfiction all the time. I wanted to know how to do this, how to do that. Of course, there was no internet at that point, And so all I was doing, I was spending a lot of time in the library. Since we came from a very poor family, that was a great resource for me because I could just go to the library and it was free. And so that was really the beginning of my passion for education and for wanting to help other people be educated as well and to feel empowered to always ask, or ask a question. Um, it made a huge difference in my life and you know that's what I've been doing. I've been teaching students for decades how to ask those questions, how to ask the difficult questions, how to think critically, how to be creative, how to be innovative, and always to believe in yourself. Be sure to believe in yourself. Doesn't matter if this person has a long title. You have the right to believe in yourself. So. That's um, the beginning of my life and the beginning of my story. And um, I didn't mention there was one other thing about going to college. As I mentioned, my parents didn't really want me to go to college, so they cut me off financially. And uh, so I had to pay for my own college. And fortunately, I got a scholarship to UC Berkeley and, um, and I earned my way through college. And um, I did, you know, and then I got married when I was about 21. So, um, and by that time I already had a college degree and I was earning enough money to buy food. So things looked up. Esther, the book is phenomenal because you share a lot of other life or death early stories. Talk about how the connection between how parents, you know, kind of live vicariously through their children's lives. And we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a few moments. The book isn't titled How to Raise Successful Children. It's actually titled, of course, how to Raise Successful People. In many ways, it is both a parenting book and it is a leadership book. And we'll talk more about that. First, before we do that, you have three daughters that have had some modicum of success. Would you uh, check your humility for a moment and talk about the success that your daughters have achieved and how that was an impetus also in you writing this book? Yes, so when my daughters were born, the main thing that I wanted them to do was to be independent. So from the time they were born, that's what I focused on. And it sounds kind of crazy, but you know, I read to them early. I tried to teach them, 
you know, to do a lot of things for themselves early, uh, and they loved it. And I, I'm not sure other parents might have done that, but I did it because, again, of this unfortunate experience when I was a child, I wanted them to be able to think for themselves. Always be able to think for yourself. It's so important. And um, so what I did with them is that they started swim lessons really early. They could swim when they were like 12 months, 14 months. Uh, they learned how to ride bikes early. They watched Sesame Street, so they had a lot of information about letters and characters or whatever. And I just, what's this? What is your street name? What letter does it start with? And you know, you'd drive down the street and you could look at the letters on the on the signs. Um, that was the main thing. I always wanted them to have a sense of they were empowered, and I did not have a goal for them. Like I didn't want them specifically to be like a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or anything like that. I just wanted them to do what they wanted to do and to make sure that they felt empowered and happy with whatever it was they were doing. So, you know, this worked out really well. Um, as little children, they were always trying new things. And I mean, one of the reasons that I'm excited about Scott's three boys is because little boys tend to be the most innovative. And so not to say that girls aren't as innovative, but, you know, I tried to have my children be as outgoing and innovative and sports oriented as I possibly can. Um, and, you know, they're, interestingly enough, they're doing the same thing with their own children. They think that it's really important for kids to feel empowered. Um, and so, I would say that um, that is the main thing that I did with them. Just trying to think, they I did things that would probably shock you, but I'll tell you one of them. Like back in the day before all the security in the airplanes, you know, you could just go to the gate with your child and just put them on a plane. And so that's one of the things I did. I mean, I sent Anne to Los Angeles to meet her grandmother and she was five, five years old by herself. And she had like a little tag around her neck that said her name, her phone number, her grandmother's name, grandmother's phone number. But, you know, she was, she was not afraid at all. She marched on that plane by herself. And then she flew down to LA and she came off the plane. And my mom said, oh my God, she acted like she knew exactly what she was doing. Um, but we aren't giving our children that opportunity anymore because everything's you know, so controlled and everyone's afraid of things and there's um, security. Um, I tried and I think there's opportunities that may be not like that, but there's other opportunities for kids to feel empowered. And that's what I did in my classes. Um, and I know it's, again, this is gonna sound like it was really wacky, but you know, in the Zoom epidemic, pandemic situation that we had all last year. So what I did in the spring of 2020, because I was still teaching at that time, is I turned over the Zoom classes to my students. So people were like, why would you do that? You know, wh why not just do it yourself? Can you imagine how exciting it is for kids to lead the class for a day or for two days or a week or whatever you decide? And let me tell you, all their friends showed up, everybody, because everybody wanted to interact with everybody else. They were missing them, they were lonely. So that that continued all last year, the whole year, September till actually just this last, the end of May. I retired in June of last year because I'd already been teaching for about 40 years. And so, but the program still continues. There's five amazing teachers there in the media arts program at Palo Alto High School, and they continued the same philosophy. And during the whole year, kids continued to publish. There are 10 publications there, and kids continued to do the work and with passion because they were in charge and they felt good about themselves and they were really happy to see the results of their work. So um, that's hopefully the answers that you were looking for. <laughs> that's great, Esther. Thank <laughs> you for sharing that. Your daughters, the $3, have been wildly successful in their careers. 
And uh, in the book, you open and talk about this field of attachment research. And Kevin, I want to move from insecure to secure attachment. Can you expand on that concept? Yeah, secure. So attachment, you want your child to be attached to you. You want them to be bonded to you. You want them to see you as a resource to help them um, in any way that they, you can help them but you don't want them to be so dependent on you that they can't operate independently, that they can't do things on their own. And so, for example, um, I'll just give an example with Susan. Um, when she was five years old, we moved to Geneva, Switzerland. She had to cope with a new language, a new country, a new sibling, Anne was just born, but she felt empowered enough that she was willing to go with a family, a French family that invited her to go for a week in the Swiss Alps. She went. And she went because she felt like she could always ask questions. She didn't need me. She knew I was a resource. She knew she met the other mother and the other mother seemed pretty nice. And so she was willing to take that risk. And I think that's what you want your kids to do, to be able to be independent to take a risk, but to see you as an authoritative resource that can help them help them navigate, not do it for them. And that's what's happening in the helicopter parenting syndrome that we have going around the world, where the parent actually clears the path, does it for the child. And that does not work, because what that does is it makes the child dependent dependent on you. They like, I can't do it without my mom. And you don't want that to happen. You want them to say, I can do it. And if I need assistance of any kind, I know where to call. That's the difference. Esther, in fact, you dedicate a whole chapter to yourself that kind of the ultimate goal as a parent is to make yourself obsolete. And right. I'm guessing it's fairly counterintuitive to a lot of people because there's a certain segment of us out there that are parents that live vicariously through our kids, that we you know, wanna uh, uh, have our children remain our friends and be around and we want them to want us. It gives us some validation. What do you say to the parents that are introspective enough where they're perhaps uncovering that they want their children to be dependent upon them because it makes them feel valued. It gives them worth. It gives them purpose in life that these people need me but the problem is that perpetuates and then that child becomes dependent upon you and never becomes independent. And you never, never become, become obsolete. Right. Never becomes independent. You, you want to be obsolete. You want to be in a situation where they can reach out to you if they need you. But for the most part, they solve things on their own. And, you know, my daughters are all in careers where they're doing things on their own. I mean, Susan's the CEO of YouTube. She doesn't consult me at all. You know, she she's empowered. She feels good about making decisions with her team on her own. And but she's been doing this her whole life. And that's why she feels empowered to do that. And the same with Janet, who's a professor of pediatrics. She's an epidemiologist. So she's had a lot of work in this pandemic. And so I think this is all really important for parents to know. You know, your child will still want to be friends with you, will still need you. They don't have to be dependent on you to need you. I mean, I'm lucky to say that my children call me all the time and invite me over. And, you know, I did make some mistakes at the beginning. I will point those out right now, actually. When Susan's first child was born, I mean, I cannot tell you how excited I was about this. I was bringing over toys every time I came. Toys, toys, clothes, clothes. I mean, my God. Finally, she had to say to me, Mom, Mom, our house isn't big enough to have all the stuff you're bringing over. Not only that, maybe, maybe we don't want it. So, you know, you have to remember, you've still got to respect them and their ideas and what they want. And it's their children, by the way. Even though they're your grandchildren, the children are the children of your children and they get to make all those decisions. And so I think it's so important for parents to set up a situation where they're kind of consultant, but they're not the driver. And the children will still need you and love you. You are always their mom and dad, no matter what. 
So it's okay to let them do some things on their own. It's okay to let them try it out and not succeed and then do it again. That's the philosophy I had in my class. I mean, my kids never worried about their grade ever, which is a was crazy thing if you're teaching, you know, academic classes. But the reason they didn't worry about it is because you could always revise, revise until you get it right. And the same thing at home, you know, just, I don't know, if you want to bake cookies and they come out like rocks, bake them again. So that's always been my philosophy. This is uh, uh, counterintuitive to me because I would not want to bake the cookies twice. But the point is, is Dr. Covey was very famous for a story called Green and Clean in his book, The Seven Habits and in the Work Program. And he was commonly you know, quoted as, I'm not raising grass, I'm raising boys. There's a whole exercise around how the boys were empowered to clean up the yard to their own standard. But the fact of the matter is their yard was the worst in the neighborhood, but Dr. <laughs> Covey wasn't focused on the yard. He was focused on teaching his boys responsibility and you know, uh, understanding the level of quality that was acceptable. It's called green and clean. And I'm often haunted by, I'm not baking cookies, right? I'm, I'm, I'm raising boys. I'm not raising grass. I'm raising boys. I think it's an important reminder. In fact, you have a whole chapter that I think you titled, Your Children Are Not Your Clone. Expand on that concept. Your children are not your clone. That's one of the most important parts of the book. You have to realize that your children are, they're, they're like gifts from heaven, gifts from God, and they are on their own trajectory. And it's your responsibility to water and nurture and take care of them. They're not your clones. They are their own selves, and you need to help them. And that's one of the things that I always found really important. I mean, I'm a teacher, right? I wanted my children, I thought, well, let's see, if you want to be a teacher, I can help you do that. But if you want to be something else, I can also help you be whatever it is you want to be. I ne- I didn't even dream of YouTube. I mean, there was no YouTube around in the 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s. I mean, who would have ever guessed? But, you know, you believe in your child and you give them that opportunity to be who they want, not who I want. What would have happened if I would have, like, forced my daughter to become a doctor or, you know, or well, and majored in molecular biophysics? And I go like, yeah, go to medical school. You know, that's the thing to do. Um, I never said that. I said, you need to find your own path. And all kids, if you want them to be a happy, successful adult, they have to believe in themselves and find their own path. And okay, maybe they were doing the gardening in a very strange way at whatever house it was. Um, But, you know, they need to learn to do it. And I had a dog, we had a dog, I should say, named Truffle. And Truffle was taken care of by my three daughters. And if Truffle didn't get food, it was their fault. I mean, you have to give them responsibility and trust them, and it works. Esther, you share a story about um, one of your daughters. I think she was maybe the 16th employee at Google, and you talk about this 20% kind of rule that they had there. Will you take that 20% rule and talk about why that's so important in life as parents and perhaps as leaders inside organizations to allow people to, to fail, to exert their creative energy and juices. That's right. So my daughter was a 16th employee at Google. And basically, they have a philosophy at Google. It's called 20% time. And so you work 80% of the time on whatever it is is your job. And then you, if you want to, it's not obligatory. It's just an option. You can then take 20% of your time and work on something that you're passionate about. And um, so that is something that um, happened in my classroom. Um, well, actually, it's even more than 20%. I gave kids more than 20% of the time. But I started a company in this pandemic called Track.app, T-R-A-C-T dot app. And it's a way for kids to do peer-to-peer, project-based learning. It's by teenagers for preteens. So the kids creating the learning are 15 to 20. The kids getting the learning are 8 to 15. And the 
purpose of that is to empower teenagers as creators and change makers and empower younger kids to be collaborative learners. And uh, it fits, tracked fits into the 20% time in a, in a school, in a classroom, because I've been trying to get teachers to do more in the classroom to give kids more control of their learning. And this way they can just say, hey guys, it's your 20% time and you know you can go on track. The reason I did that is because in the past I've done a lot of teacher training and what happened after I did a training or some of my colleagues have also had the same experience. And it's after we did a training, the teachers will ask the question like, okay, we like the 20% time, sounds like a good idea, but can you give us the lesson plan for 20% time? So see, they didn't really get the idea that the kid has to come up with their own plan. So 20% time tracked fits into that 20% time. And that's one of the reasons it just launched December 2020. And so it's six months old right now. So if anybody is interested, any teachers are interested, by the way, because I'm really trying to help education, they can just go to teach.track.app and all the information is there. But in a company, let me just tell you, if employees feel like they personally are respected, trusted and respected, given a lot of independence, allowed to collaborate instead of being dictated to all the time and treated with kindness, they'll be much more productive employees, especially if they have an option to do something that they created, they came up with, and it fits into the 20% time. And I forgot to mention, trick is in my book, the acronym trick, which is just what I went through. Trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. I say that belongs in the parenting relationship, in the teaching relationship, and in your personal relationship. Esther, you are not the first person we've had on our podcast to talk about how to be a better parent because we all know that you know, life in the home impacts life at work. In fact, for the last year and a half, life at home has also been life at work for many of us during the pandemic. As you look back on your you know, many decades raising your girls as a teacher and educator for 40 years, as a very successful author, coach, speaker, advisor, uh, give us all some practical tips that may be both applicable in our roles as parents, for those of us who are, and also as leaders of people. What are some fundamental principles that you think leaders and parents need to be aware of to both raise and grow and promote successful people, whether they are in our stewardship literally as a parent or perhaps in our guardianship as a leader in the workplace? So one of the first things, that's a great question. One of the first things <clears throat> as a leader and as a parent um, and as a teacher is to be humble. You know, you do not know it all in spite of the fact that you might be an extra expert. I would say the second most important thing that I've seen in all these relationships is trust. As a leader in a company, you need to hire people that you that have the skills you're looking for you value them and then you trust them to do their jobs you don't micromanage and i think that's one of the most important things and it is i cannot overemphasize that because it also goes along with respect you respect people you respect their ideas you don't always try to get your ideas as the primary way you you're a leader you're not a dictator and that's the same thing in the classroom you you are the teacher but you the teacher leader kids model after you you know i was always really amazed to watch when kids were doing this peer to peer learning in groups they all sounded like me and i remember when i first saw that i was like I don't remember teaching that. I don't know how did that happen. They subconsciously, they subconsciously copy you is what's happening. Yeah. And so it's really important for you to realize that. So I'm just going to reemphasize, be humble, be trusting and have respect. And it's and also kindness. I mean, they say that People, um, they don't remember what you said, 
they don't remember the lesson, but they remember how you made them feel. And that was that's really true for teachers, especially. And I always tried to make my students feel like it's okay to make a mistake and then let's do it again. Okay, so maybe you don't want to rebake the cookie you burned or became like a little rock instead. But honestly, if you want to revise your essay, you can do it as many times as you want. And I'll tell you, that's how they learn to write. They don't learn to write by watching me do it. Esther, let's, lend, let's end on that uh, comment around kindness. You shared many great stories in the book from your years as an educator in the Bay Area. Steve Jobs once uh, put his daughter in your class. He came and interviewed you first to make sure that you were going to be a competent educator. And you shared some great stories around you were just crazy enough to want to change the world. And at the end of your book, you write a beautiful passage that says, everyone needs to be trusted and be given respect for who they are. Everyone needs to be given freedom and taught how to work with others. And everyone needs to be shown kindness so that they can reflect it back to the world. Bring us home with how important it is as leaders, as parents, just as you know, members of humanity, to show kindness, not just to our children, but to those around us so that they can reflect it back. But what, what's an idea or a story or a lesson you would share there? I cannot tell you how important it is to show kindness. Maybe in this pandemic, we all know, we have seen how kindness not only makes you the giver, but the receiver have a much better experience for that day, for that week, for their month or their life. Kindness matters more than, it matters so much. Because actually when you're trusting and respecting somebody and then you are kind to them and accept, help them when they need help, accept whatever it is that they need that they might not have expressed earlier, be willing to listen. Oh my God, willing to listen. Not just tell somebody what you want to hear, them to hear, but willing to listen to them. And so I do have a lot of stories in the book about kindness. And I mean, as a teacher, you know, kids make mistakes every day. I mean, like all the time. If they didn't, if they didn't make mistakes, they wouldn't be in school. Because let's face it, mistakes, they learn from the mistakes and then they move on. And there were many situations in, in my life as a teacher where kids actually were, did things that might be even worse. Like for example, you know, um, and I had a group of students who were spending a lot of time in the dark room. And I thought, oh my God, what are they doing in that dark room? They're taking forever to develop those pictures. Oh, Honestly, we know what they were doing. They were drinking beer. Oh, that's not <laughs> what I thought, but go ahead. <laughs> that's one thing. But okay, then okay. the other thing is what you were thinking. Oh, because, well. yeah. I was thinking that they were smoking cigarettes, Esther. Come on. <laughs> oh, well, they were doing, well, they were smoking cigarettes. They were drinking beer. Okay. There you they go. had. They used the refrigerator that was supposed to hold the chemicals for the dark room to store their beer. Okay. Crafty. So what could Crafty. I do, you know, uh, as a teacher, you know, I could refer them to the administration. Do you know what would happen if you refer a kid to administration drinking on campus? You know, they're expelled, expelled, gone. So I don't do that. Never. I would never do that to a kid. In all the years I taught, I never did never sent the kids to the office. So I just caught, I came up with my own punishment and they did it. And I'm telling you, these kids today, they're in their 40s and they're still my friends, friends for life. Um, because they knew they were doing it wrong. They were young, they were silly, they were doing things oh. that they should have been doing. But if I'll only you, you had taught me Ninth grade algebra, instead of that, you know what that I had, I would have been in the Senate today. Um, <laughs> I taught algebra, can you believe that? I actually taught well, That's the algebra. most useful, useless subject in the entire American <laughs> curriculum. I don't even know what algebra is, and I took it like three times, good grief. I spent like my entire high school year on restriction because I was always failing algebra. No one could see that. I wasn't gonna be a mathematician, newsflash mom. Esther, I want to finish with one last question. You know, in many ways, 
as we parent our children, we're always thinking about our parents. We're either, you know, replicating what our parents did to us or we're avoiding it at all costs. What advice would you give to the millions of people that are listening and watching that are parents, they're going to be parents, perhaps their aunts or uncles or their, you know, foster parents or they have some role. How do we get, what, what's the healthy relationship we should have with how our parents raised us for good or for bad? What level, what role should that play in our own parenting? That's also a great question. It's very important to realize that your parents were, I don't want to call them victims, but I think that probably gets the idea across the best, of the culture that surrounded parenting at the time that they were growing up. So my father grew up in Russia. At the time he was a parent, he was a child there, his parents were told that spare the rod, spoil the child. So he was beaten all the time. When, I, when he was a parent, he did the same thing to me. I was beaten. He probably would have been arrested today. He beat me with a belt. He was beaten with the belt. So what did I do? I realized he was just a part of the culture at the time. He was, he didn't really want to do that. And, you know, I had to forgive him for doing that. He didn't mean to, but people tend to parent the way they were parented. So one of the things I'd like you to think about is think about how you wish you would have been parented and then you can be the kind of parent you wish you would have had. And that really makes a big difference. And that's what I did for my daughters. I, I parented them the way I wished I had been parented. And that made all the difference. Two days ago, my young six-year-old son decided to run and jump through all of these beautiful English hedges that I had planted and broke off. And I've been nurturing them and clipping them like a knot, like an English knot garden, you know? And I dropped <laughs> some choice words. This is a six-year-old, right? And I, and I was my dad because we were raised in a home with all these antiques and you couldn't touch anything and everything was very clean and clear and... And I like lived on pins and needles my entire childhood. I have a good dad, he's still alive, he's still married to my mother. But I mean, who raises kids like in an antique museum? Seriously, and I see that I'm doing the same thing now. I forgive my dad because my dad was raised um, without a father, his father died early, his twin brother died of polio, and my father was raised in a tough situation. But you're right, in many cases I am my father, who's a good man, but you know, probably could have lightened up a little bit. And so I appreciate the advice today. Esther, your book is phenomenal. It's a great parenting book. It's a great leadership book. It's How to Raise Successful People. What a genius title. I encourage people to read it regardless of what role you are in life. Esther, thank you for taking the time to invest in us today. Great luck to you on your most recent entrepreneurial venture. And thank we're you. delighted to have you back in the future as a future book or project comes down the pike. No doubt you have many more ideas to come because you are just crazy enough to quote Steve Jobs to want to change the world. Esther, thank you for joining us today on Leadership. Oh my God, it's a wonderful interview. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed being here. Such an honor to have you on today. Thank you so much. The book is How to Raise Successful People from the thousands of books in our studio. I highly recommend it. I devoured it. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, I even postponed the interview with Esther so that I could finish the book and not just... Um, be a better interview, but hopefully be a better parent to my own three children. Uh, delighted you joined us. We'll see you back here next week for a new interview on leadership.